Viruses come in all shapes and sizes, and the problems they can cause are equally diverse. From the sore throat and runny nose of the common cold, to the paralysis of polio, and the potentially fatal breathing problems and fevers of the coronavirus. But what is it about these tiny little things that can make us so sick? It turns out it's a tale of hijack and war on a microscopic scale. All viruses consist of a bit of genetic material wrapped up in a protein case. Some have a fatty outer layer too, like the coronavirus. The goal of a virus, like any living thing, is to reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. But unlike living things, it doesn't have its own molecular machinery to do so. You need more than genes and a coat if you want to procreate. So a virus needs to hijack a living cell to borrow the enzymes, molecular building blocks, and cellular machinery to reproduce itself. That's the basics, but there's plenty of scope for variation. There are at least 320,000 different viruses that are known to infect mammals alone, more than 200 of which infect humans. There could be millions of different types out there. There are even viruses that infect bacteria. And each virus has a preferred type of cell to infect. Some aren't very picky. They'll happily hijack cells from a range of different animals, like the rabies virus, which can infect humans, along with dogs, badgers, raccoons, bats and several others. Others are more choosy. They like a particular type of cell belonging to a particular species, like HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus, which only affects human white blood cells. Occasionally, some viruses switch. With a small change to their outer structure, a virus can jump the species barrier. Ones that once affected just animals can suddenly start infecting humans too. Scientists think this is how coronavirus came to infect humans in the first place, jumping from an animal like a bat. Now it targets the cells in our lungs. But to get to its target cells, a virus first needs to enter the body. Our skin has an outer surface of dead cells, which are no use to a virus, so instead it gains entry through one of the few openings in our dead cell armour. Our mouth, nose, eyes, genitals or a cut in the skin. That's why we're all told not to touch our face during the coronavirus pandemic. We're providing the viruses with an express shuttle to our body's ports of entry. Once a virus finds a suitable cell, it injects its genetic material inside. And what happens then depends on the specific instructions contained within its genes. Some viruses go the slow and steady route. They either lie quietly doing nothing, waiting for the right moment, or they reproduce themselves slowly using the cell's spare resources and causing little damage. But other viruses do things with a bit more flair. Once the virus has access to the cell, it'll completely take over and destroy it in an uncontrollable push to reproduce itself as quickly as possible. One of the ways it does this is by triggering a cell's inbuilt self-destruct program called apoptosis. Apoptosis is a totally normal process in the life and death of a cell, and it's needed to keep our organs and tissues working properly. A healthy adult will normally lose up to 70 billion cells to apoptosis every single day. But the problem comes when a virus triggers this programmed cell death at the wrong time in the wrong type of cell. Sometimes it's not so bad if it's in a type of cell that can reproduce to replace the lost troops. Like when a cold affects your airways, the cells in there can refresh pretty quickly. But things are more serious when the cells can't do that. The polio virus targets mature nerve cells which can't be replaced. The cells are lost forever, leading to paralysis. But often, it's not the virus itself that creates the symptoms of a viral infection. Rather, it's the body waging war with itself. The immune system is our defence against anything foreign inside the body. White blood cells and other chemicals recognise and attack viruses and the cells they infect, and the collateral damage of that war is what makes us feel like crap. Fevers are caused by the body intentionally raising its temperature in the hopes of killing off infected cells and slowing the virus's reproduction. And aches are caused by swelling throughout the body. Chemicals released by dying cells cause blood vessels to leak fluid into the surrounding tissue, causing swelling. This helps to keep viruses away from any other cells it might infect. So, our immune systems rescue us from the ongoing effects of a viral infection, 
normally at the cost of a few days of feeling ill. Eventually, the virus is defeated. But occasionally things can go wrong, like in the severe cases of coronavirus. As with other viral infections, the release of fluid and swelling helps to fight the spread inside the body, but too much can be a problem. The chemicals that cause the swelling can activate more white blood cells, which release more chemicals, which cause more swelling, and so on, in a chain reaction. The result is a huge amount of fluid in the lungs, causing pneumonia, which makes it hard to breathe. If the immune chain reaction continues, this swelling starts to affect other organs, like the kidneys and intestines, and they start to shut down too. Right now, medical scientists don't know why this happens to some people, or how to stop it. They can just do their best to keep them alive while their immune systems get back on track. And yet, without our immune systems, we wouldn't last long in the face of these minuscule biological terrorists. And what's even better is that your immune cells remember a virus it's met once before, and will know how to fight it the next time, making us immune to its effects for the rest of our lives. Which is a little ray of sunshine to cling to while you're avoiding, fighting or recovering from your private internal war. Thank you.